Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. Um, I'm here to talk about Zeus and Battle IG2 servers, um, or the platform and the accelerator ecosystem surrounding it. Um, I'm uh, so whether you're kind of just curious about how this platforms come along, or if you're uh, you know if you want to put this system to use uh, from us directly or or or, or for yourself, um, or you want to make this system available for for other people, uh, we have some. Uh, exciting news for you that we want to share today, and, uh, and, and I hope it's going to be helpful. Um, so I'm going to be dividing this talk into two parts. Um, on one is more on the server side and the enablement part of it, and uh, the, the other side is, is specific accelerators uh, that we're playing with and, and give you some examples of that. Um, so um, I do have a pretty full agenda. Um, so I'm going to take all, all the time that there is here. And I'm going to take the questions outside the room. Um, I'll be eager to take those. Um, and I have some samples there of, uh, of, of some of the boards and, and things like that. Uh, we also have a server in the open power booth um, if you want to take a look. So let's get started. So um, this project, uh, you know, the Zays and Battle IG2 project started in uh, 2016. Um, it, it was started as a collaboration between Google, Rackspace, IBM, Ingresys, and, uh, and other open foundations, open compute included. Um, I have them on the list there. Um, so two years back, uh, we started this. And uh, last year, we were here um, uh, showing off the first uh, systems um, that we had. Uh, both the Zayas and Battle IG2 form factors. Uh, we also did a little bit deep dive on uh, on some of the technologies we plan to implement or we already had implemented um, and their status. So that talk is going to be pretty helpful uh, since we're going to be pretty moving pretty fastly here. If you want to go deep dive into specific topics, that's the talk I think. Uh, yeah, and I have the link for that talk in the backup slides. Um, so cut short to 2018. Here to give you a little bit of platform update and the accelerator ecosystem uh, surrounding it um, and how you can maybe use it. You know, some hints for that as well. So um, I'm gonna, you know, for people who are new to the project, I'm gonna just, uh, you know, have a brief family tree uh, with pictures um, that you can, that I'm gonna take you through. So in the center, you have the Zayas motherboard, which is between, uh, which is common between the Google and the Rackspace uh, um, form factors. Um, this motherboard is basically a dual socket Power9 server. Um, you have 48 volts input, and uh, and and. Um, we have basically we've designed for front I/O access, you know, for standard um, OCP form factor essentially, um, and we have um, the the I/O here is pretty exciting. We have 80 lanes of PCIe Gen 4 and uh, 32 lanes of uh, Open Capi, and uh, PCIe Gen 4, as you know, is twice. You know, we, we just heard the talk. I think uh, the previous speaker um, is twice as fast as Gen 3. And Open Capi at bandwidth is uh, thrice as fast as uh, uh, PCIe Gen 3. Um, so that you know, if you do the do the math a little bit math here, this that's equivalent to having essentially 250 lanes of uh, PCIe Gen 3 in, in one scale-out server. I want to underline scale-out, right? Um, um, and um, you know the the stack for the, the server is fully open. Uh, it's not just open hardware. Uh, you know, it's it's one of the one of the you know, one of the initial systems to have both the uh, host firmware and the BMC server um, firmware uh, completely open source. Um, and that's available on GitHub if you want to check it out. Um, on the left here, you have the Zayas tray, which is a compact enclosure um, around the Zayas motherboard. Um, and uh, um, it's basically 1.5 OU tall. Um, so you can't uh, fit um, standard half height, half length cards, uh, but you can fit some uh, that are shorter than that. Um, Um, it's compatible with 48 volts open rack v2, but you'll uh, need a deployment shelf to put around the server, essentially. Um, and, and that way you can kind of, like, say it'll, it'll fit in the standard rack. On the right, you have uh, the Battle IG2 server, which is uh, built for full depth open rack uh, v2. And we have a, uh, this is a 2 OU chassis, so we're able to f uh, fit half height, half length cards. And for full height, uh, full length cards, we have a couple of riser uh, options for you if you want to, if you want to support them or or use your I/O there. Uh, we we do have a hot swap storage bay. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Uh, we have hot swap fans, VGA access. Uh, we have enough wattage plan, um, um, you know, beyond the motherboard. We have extra wattage plan to support some of these accelerators that you can see in the riser. So um, this section is a little bit of a development update. It's about um, what we're doing 
um, at a high level to consume this server ourselves, and also, as a byproduct, make it easy for other people to consume it. Um, so, you know, this is the picture, design picture that we are always used. The Zayas motherboard in, uh, in the center, uh, the storage expander board behind it, the fan, board, uh, so the fan and the power board behind it, which uh, supplies 12 volts and 48 volts power um, to, the, to different subsystems. And you have the universal backplane, uh, which supports SAS, SATA, and NVMe drives. Um, so then we went to the test phases. We had test boards. Um, you know, we, we ran a bunch of tests. We, we validated a, a lot of things. We made optimizations to the design. Uh, you've seen some of these test uh, server pictures here and there in the media. Um, and then now we uh, enter the PVT, right? So green boards, right? Green boards are very exciting uh, because they just represent all the work that's gone in uh, to kind of change things over time and get it to a stage that's kind of consumable. Um, it also speaks to the confidence that we have in the design, essentially. Uh, the sideboards are also going green. Uh, I don't have the pictures right now. Um, a, a little fun fact, this motherboard here, I think is just one of the only five motherboards maybe here uh, in the US. Uh, it's straight out of the factory, very fresh. Um, we just, just uh, got those boards here uh, to show them to you. So, so you have, uh, essentially, you have a new motherboard. You have a new processor, right? And you have lots of new I.O. I spoke about that. Um, so how do you actually use that, right? How do you, so you know, having it on paper, and having it on the motherboard, uh, it's, it's better. Having it on the motherboard is better. But say, how do you actually you put them to use? Um, you need I.O., right? So there's I.O. out there that can do Gen 4. Uh, but then anyone who's in the room who works for an ODM or an OEM uh, would know it's really difficult to, and, and takes time to qualify some of the new I.O. So that takes, it puts a little bit of pressure on how you can use, how widely you can see, use the system. So to ease that for ourselves, and then it'll help you as well, uh, we've qualified, uh, not one, not two, uh, in some cases, three sources um, of, uh, in specific subsystem. And we've done that all around, all around the, the server. Um, and you know, the reason why we did that is pretty apparent. Uh, we want to decrease the consumption time for various product groups within Rackspace. Um, and as a byproduct, you will benefit that from as well. So you have. Um, you know, you have the server now, everything within the server, you have the I.O., it's qualified, you want to use it, you need a rack, right? You want to, you want, you want to power this up, right? Um, so one of the things, blockers for rack space to kind of consume 48 volts as is, um, was an absence of uh, automatic transfer switch solution. So we've partnered with uh, Delta to, to build an ATS, um, an, an inbuilt ATS power shelf. Um, we have the ATS samples here as well. Um, and, and, uh, so that's a, a picture of the actual ATS in, in, one, of, in one of our labs. Um, and uh, you, know, you can see all green stuff, so everything's good, hopefully, right? Um, so, um, so we have that picture. So, so we basically have this ATS working. And it's, I think, one of the first implementations with the integrated ATS. And that really helps us just you know, take the 48 volt track and just you know, plug it in our, our data centers and, and go. Um, so you have the power shelf. Now you need a rack, you know, bus bar, bus bar clip, things like that. Um, so we built a rack. Um, you know, um, those are the specs there. It's a 30, um, 30 kilowatt rack, essentially, a single bus bar. Um, and we built that. We integrated the power shelf and the networking there. Uh, we plugged servers in. We tested it quite a bit, and, and we, like, we like where it is. It's pretty easy to consume. Uh, for us, it was pretty seamless. It, was, you know, it uses the same 60 amp plug, so we could just unplug the 12 volt track, plug the you know, 48 volt track. It's, it's, it was pretty easy to move there. Um, we talk about a lot of things happening in this presentation, but I want to just point out that even to get the clip right, we had to work with uh, you know, T and Amphenol to, to do quite a lot of revisions and stuff to line the clip with the bus bar. So a lot of work has gone into it, but everything works now, so, so that's good. Um, so I want to put this um, you know, past uh, few slides into perspective, into our road to 10x. Right? So we've been involved with OCP from uh, 2011. And we've been playing in open power since about three, three and a half years. Um, we've been playing accelerators you know, full time since last year. Um, and and when we, when we, later this year, when we have a, a, a pilot phase with some of our customers, um, a limited, limited pilot phase with some of our customers, we would have put all these three learnings in different communities to use in this. And that's incredible. So basically, um, things take time to build. Um, some of these you know, 10x performance improvements take time to build, but they're worth it, and they can be real. 
So uh, now I'm going to give you a little bit of technology update. Uh, we talked about you know high level consumption update um, in in a technology update. Um, so um, so we are trying to innovate as a community in various uh, aspects of of data center, right? Um, and and you know to get around the Moore's law problems, to increase the efficiency, to the to account for the data boom, essentially, uh, right? Uh, various reasons. And um, so you know you can find servers that are innovating in one or two of these areas pretty easily today because they're trying to push the envelope and get that efficiency up. Uh, but through this server, we're trying to innovate in all of them. Um, and 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 we feel you know only when all these things play with each other, um, that's when they'll be mainstream, right? Um, you know, one new thing needs to play with the play play with the other. Um, in the interest of time, we'll uh, concentrate on these four topics today um, and as an update. So um, PCIe Gen 4, or, or MES 2.0, right? Um, I think um, this is one of the first um, implementations of PCIe Gen 4 and MES 2.0. You can see that here. Um, and just, I, I just want to remind that you know, there's, we have four by 16 PCIe slots. Uh, one of them is in the MES form factor, and two by eight uh, um, PCIe Gen 4 slots. Um, you can see the speeds and feeds there. Essentially, you know, by 16 Gen 4 slots enough to do about 250 gigs of uh, bandwidth, right? Uh, online, rate, online rate. So I have a little bit of demo here. Essentially, um, I have two ConnectX5 uh, mesh form factor. Um, they're from Mellanox, basically. Mesh form factor ca cards um, you know, plugged in the server. Um, you know, if it was a Gen 3 card, you would have expected somewhere around you know, close to 100 gigs of bandwidth, right? Um, but uh, it's because it's a Gen 4 card, uh, you know, we ran a little bit of iPerf demo, and we clock about you know, pretty close to 200. Uh, gigabits per second uh, of real data moving back and forth. And uh, you know, we did the same thing with storage. It's not limited to network gen 4, right? Uh, we, we took an Editicom NVMe Express card, plugged into the system. Uh, the gen 3 limitation of that, you know, uh, of that workload, of I.O. workload, would have been about 6.8 gigabytes per second of usable uh, actual data moving back and forth. Uh, but the one that we measure is 13.5 uh, gigabytes per second. Um, and, and so you know, what I want to point out is basically Gen 4 is, is not just on paper. It's not just in systems. It's actually there's usable I.O. here in network and, uh, and, and storage um, for you. So you know, it good, looks good, right? Like say you know, this I.O., this high-speed I.O. Uh, looks good on a single slot, right? But you have so many lanes. You have systems with so many um, lanes supporting so much I.O. Um, and do you, are the processors able to push it? Is this processor that we use here, is, is it able to actually push some usable uh, bandwidth there? Um, so test that. I took a heap of uh, ConnectX5 cards, a bunch of them, plugged them into the system. Um, um, so you can see all the, all the cards in uh, LSPCI there. Um, you can see all of them trained to Gen 4. Um, and um, what I did was I took two such systems, because you can't really run a test you know, uh, or, or display uh, a network band with just one system, and then you would be cheating. Right? Um, so you took two systems, connected it via a 100 gig switch, right? um, and I ran an iPerf test. Um, sorry, um, iPerf test. Uh, the results here indicate that we can run on this server a one terabit per second at line rate network bandwidth um, between these two servers. Um, and, and just think about that for a second. We're talking about 100, 200, right? Uh, you can do it terabits per second with the network bandwidth. Um, and, and you know, I have a little bit of recipe here for you uh, if you want to try this at home. Um, you know, if you have these, you can definitely reproduce that. Um, I have a video for this as, as well um, in the backup slides. Um, and that's more for most demos that I have here. Um, so Gen 4 is real. It's ready to be consumed. Um, it's, it's, it's working on our server. We have usable I.O. Right? The only thing that, you know, um, I don't have a slide here, but I want to point out is Gen 4 switches are also needed for mainstream Gen 4 adoption. And we're working pretty closely with Broadcom. Uh, they just announced their Gen 4 switches at uh, the Open Power Summit. Uh, we are um, working with them to qualify some of those Gen 4 switches on this server. Um, so so that will resolve a lot of uh, you know, GPU bandwidth limitations, as the previous speaker kind of noted, um, and storage uh, expansion as well. Uh, bottlenecks would be uh, solved. So um, I have a little bit of a slide here with Battle IG2 storage. Um, so we have, basically, it fits um, 24 uh, SAS SATA or NVMe drives. Um, um, most of the slots are trimode. What this means is, you know, you can take a pick a slot, uh, you know, remove a remove a drive, a SAS drive or, or a SATA drive, and and plug NVMe. Um, and you know, when the 
processor supports it, you can actually hot swap it. So we have all the hardwa hardware provisions for hot swap. We have a little bit of demo, hot swap demo at 1 p.m. I have a little bit of talk on deep dive of this storage, um, storage system um, at the storage work group. Um, so 48 volts. The server runs 48 volts. I just want to briefly touch on that. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the things highlighted in blue, essentially the CPU and the DIMMs, um, they can take 48 volts and convert to one volt or, or you know, specific rail voltages uh, around one volt um, at one step. And then you know, we've done that, with, and, and that helps us uh, increase the efficiency of the server um, and, and all that goodness, right? There are some parts of uh, you know, still GPU storage, still kind of use 12 volts, 5 volts, things like that. They don't, they don't go down or take inputs at one volt. Uh, but we do have a very scalable design here, uh, a, feeder, a power feeder board that can say, for example, when you know, GPUs go to 48 volts, all you would have to do is just rev this fan board. You don't have to rev the whole motherboard. It's very scalable, very, very uh, improvable, essentially. So if you're someone who's building a 48-volt GPU, uh, uh, this server would be pretty perfect to test it um, or, or run it initially. So uh, now I want to touch a little bit briefly on um, OpenCAPI and uh, NVLink. Um, so uh, there are two bricks per, um, per uh, Power9 server. Uh, Power9 uh, socket, essentially. Um, and you know, each brick is uh, doing 20, 25 gigabytes per second, right? Um, so, so you have four bricks, so it's, it's 100 gigabytes per second, essentially, right? Um, so we use slim SAS connectors. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with Amphenol, uh, creating all kinds of cables to support different accelerators, different lengths, um, you know, loop back testing for motherboard to make sure it can you know, do 25 gig. All the motherboards can do 25 gig when they're fresh out of the factory. So we're pushing the boundaries here. We have a bunch of part numbers for all these, uh, which we want to very well document and, and, and you know, put in a central place for other people who want to uh, consume coherency. So um, to kind of point out some of the benefits of uh, um, OpenCAPI, um, I've, I've run a little bit of demo here. So basically, each Battle IG2 server or Zayas server can fit four um, um, OpenCAPI cards, right? So I plugged four OpenCAPI cards, all, all of them in, um, you know, cabled them in um, into the processor um, and then on the motherboard. And I ran a little bit of demo. This is parallel, um, uh, you know, parallelly running uh, bandwidth test, uh, real data. Basically, so per link, we have 22 gigabytes of data, real data moving in and out, um, and all four of them. And without any drop, uh, essentially, that's pretty much close to the line rate. And, and you know, um, so, so, but, so to summarize, right, that demo, um, so we have four open CAPI cards trained at 25.78125, um, you know, which is 3x faster than, um, than PCIe Gen 3, as I pointed out earlier. A round trip latency of 80 nanoseconds, which is, uh, you know, depending upon how you measure it, you know, four to five x lesser than PCIe, um, some of the generations of PCIe. Um, you know, I just told you about the bandwidth test. And then there's no kernel overhead for, for doing mem copies. So, and then they also have an upstream driver. So these three things itself, uh, you know, are a trifecta, essentially, right? So all the things you need to you know, accelerate your workload um, are here, and they're supported. You know, they're supported on this server via OpenCAPI, right? Um, that's pretty pretty amazing um, that you can actually do that today. So I want to call you know OpenCAPI is basically a faster and cooler PCI, right? Um, with an upstream driver, essentially. Um, you know, there the, there are. Um, and I want to skip to the accelerators, which is kind of the main point of the talk, right? Um, um, so uh, there are three different form factors of accelerators. We've outlined them, um, you know, in the same stage last year. Um, we, we were, you know, basically these were just concepts at that point of time about how should accelerators look like, you know, you know, uh, just generic PCIe accelerators um, that can do coherency via PCIe, um, or you know, P, um, you know. Um, accelerators with a PCIe card edge that, want, that do coherence via a dedicated link, a 25 gig link, um, are parallel uh, to the motherboard accelerators that also cable in for their coherence, right? So we've actually built all these solutions uh, with various cards. Um, you know, we've, we've tested the cables there, um, you know, everything, uh, you know, we, all these can be, can be real, 
right? But um, there is a little bit of scope of improvement here uh, because these are very early implementations. You can see this connector being on the top of the server. That can be a little bit challenging for, you know, uh, if you want to do um, uh, um, cable routing. Um, if you want to fit more of these cards, you know, four of these cards, the cable routing can be too tight. Uh, there are a bunch of improvements that can be made, um, and, and we've learned quite a bit implementing these. And I think as a server workgroup, we would, we would benefit from coming up you know, kind of a standard or guidance in, in, in you know, you know uh, cards with, in, with these form factors, coherent cards with these form factors, essentially. Um, on that note, I want to skip. Uh, I want to. I want to go to specific PCIe accelerators that we are looking at. Uh, the, the first PCIe accelerator uh, we were looking at is the the Volta uh, V100, the PCIe form factor essentially. It's a full height, full length card. Um, so we have a little bit of riser solution to to support that. Um, I don't have to tell you the features of the Volta card. It's widely um, you know publicized and widely available. Um, it's really good for deep learning applications, um, and we can fit those in this card uh, without any issues. And uh, the other PCIe card uh, that we're playing with is the Nalatech uh, Flash GT Plus. So essentially, think about this as a memory expansion card. Um, and, and its coherence protocols are tunneled over PCIe. It's a Gen 4 PCIe card, one of the first Gen 4 cards. Um, you know, it's, it fits either uh, onboard storage or you can cable the storage via the, the, the storage drawer that we have in, in, in the G2 server. Um, you know, I'm going to list some of the NVLink. Uh, effort that we're doing. Um, this is pretty exciting. Um, so we are bringing the first uh, CPU to GPU NVLink implementation in an open uh, in an open compute kind of form factor. Um, and, and we have these test boards. And uh, what they'll help us do is basically bring NVLink, um, uh, CPU to GPU NVLink in, in, in this form factor. And that's basically 50, you know, 50 gigabytes of, uh, of, of uh, bandwidth between the, server, between the CPU and the GPU. Um, and and uh, you know, that, that's in single direction and 100 gigabytes per second um, in, in you know, two directions, right? And that's, again, three times faster than you know, any other PCIe implementation or PLX implementation of GPUs that you can do. Um, it's, it's also one of the first NVLink 2.01 wire implementations, so we're uh, very carefully doing that. So I work there. Um, and we use basically two slim SAS cables to kind of cable uh, the GPUs into the CPU um, slim SAS connectors for doing 25 gig. Um, I don't have to tell you again much about the SXM2 form factor of the Volta as well. Uh, it's slightly higher in performance in, in certain form factors, about 7% or so than the PCIe one. But bandwidth is where um, you know co bandwidth and coherence are is where it makes a big difference, right? Um, this is you know I, I want to point out why this is really cool. Um, you know this is this is one of the first kind of disaggregated implementations of CPU to GPU NVLink as well. So it might it might give rise to a lot of like say um, uh, JBox, as you know, JBox are really famous for scaling deep learning nowadays, right? So it'll, I, I believe this will really solve the deep learning, um, you know, bandwidth bottleneck, um, and and when scaled out to more GPUs, and and I think we're you know we're doing some of the early effort there, and that's really exciting. So. You know, we are playing with uh, three open CAPI accelerators. The first one is the flash storage accelerator from uh, Molex. Um, it's essentially uh, an FPGA, uh, a Zinc FPGA, which is um, an FPGA and an ARM core kind of embedded in, in, in one socket. Um, and a and, and bunch of I.O. You have, you know, huge storage, human, huge amount of storage, um, you know, a lot of memory here, um, network cards, ne you know, uh, network uh, uh, interfaces for for the data plane to communicate between different cards. Um, and that, this is really cool, right? Uh, you know, when, when, when um, on some of the keynotes, when we were talking about disaggregation, low latency storage, you know, next generation storage, this is how we get there, right? Real form factors, real implementations um, of, of, uh, and, and of, uh, of the storage um, in, in, you know, using coherence. So this card kind of basically connects it into the open CAPI form factor. Each card, uh, open CAPI connector. So each card essentially can do, you know, connect 25 gig by eight. Um, and uh, you know, there's a bunch of features here that I've kind of um, listed. And the other card that we're playing with is the Innova 2 Flex from uh, um, from uh, Mellanox. Um, and uh, um, yeah, um, so it's a network accelerator card. And the third one is basically a development card from Alpha Data that we're playing with. They have a lot of resources for making it really easy to consume. Um, kind of running over time here. We're doing a bunch of stuff to um, you know, make it very easy to consume. These accelerators, real, lots of frameworks, and I have listed these, uh, and a bunch of links for them in the, 
in the slides. So I want to uh, take, take a moment to thank um, all the people who've contributed for you know, getting all these um, you know, things and exciting things in the server together. Uh, a lot of huge partnership here, and uh, it wouldn't have happened without all these foundations, these open foundations. Um, so you know, we're solving bottlenecks, we're easing adoption, and we're doing it together. So get on board. Um, or otherwise, you might have to do something crazy like this to kind of just join us, right, um, and, and catch up, essentially. So there's a lot of resources here. If you want to participate or, or, or adopt this server, um, you can talk to me about that. And uh, thank you. Thank you.